Coming up on Plane Crazy Down Under, we're joined by journalist, writer and airline captain Owen Zupp, talking about career bumps and the importance of being resilient. Sometimes adversity can force you to widen your vision and that has is, is definitely helped me. And we take a look at the planning that went into making the final Qantas 747 flight such an amazing send-off. They tried to uh, do the automatic uplink of the flight plan into the flight management computer but it was just too many waypoints. So they had to be all manually loaded in. So strap in, it's time to get plane crazy. Well, hi everybody and welcome back to the show. It's great to have you with us. This is, of course, the show that talks aviation right here in the great southern land. This is the second in our series for 2023. Thanks very much for all your positive comments and feedback from the first show. It's uh, it's uh, great to be back with you. And uh, equally so, it's great to be back with my good friend and co-host, Grant McHeron. How are you, mate? Hey, mate. I'm doing great. And it's a wonderful guest that we've got on sitting waiting in the wings. We should uh, probably not keep them waiting and get straight into it, yeah? Okay. So I want to quote from a recent blog post from this author who's our very special guest this week. And the second paragraph reads as such, Adversity varies in its degree, but ultimately it's inescapable. We all have challenges thrust upon us, and fate can deal a wicked hand. All we can control is how we respond, and the rest is beyond our sphere of influence. The author of that blog post is, of course, our good friend Owen's up, and he joins us now. G'day, Owen. G'day, fellas. How is it? It's been a little while. Mate, um, we want to talk today about career bumps, and we want to talk about resilience and how to get through that. I note with interest that after many years of you sitting in the right-hand seat, uh, a triumphant Facebook post by your lovely wife, Kiralee, who's also an airline pilot, says, congratulations, Captain Owens up. And you were rated as a captain in uh, about mid-September last year, 2022, uh, on the 737 for the airline for which you fly. And that had been quite a journey in itself. And no sooner, it seems to me, that uh, you would finally got those captain's bars on your epaulets than, well, fate did deal you another uh, another blow. Yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting, as you said in the first instance. Uh, I was an ANSET pilot when the collapse happened, so that meant effectively with the seniority system, you start over again, and uh, worked my way finally back up to um, uh, achieve the role of captain. I did fortunately have the uh, secondment over to another airline for three years, where I was able to sit in the left hand seat. Um, but uh, no sooner had I got the command than I was pulled up at a medical and found that I had a condition that required, well, fairly immediate surgery, uh, which resulted in me being grounded now for at least a minimum of six months before they'll review my medical situation and whether I get my ticket back or not. So, yeah, it um, was a bit of a curveball, but uh, as you quoted, uh, we all cop those from time to time. But you seem to me to be unique in the way you've coped with this. You are a, a very well-known writer, an aviation author in your own right, and you've taken to, I, I, I really believe for the benefit of all of us, for documenting that, how, how you, what your thoughts are and how this has affected you and perhaps what we can learn from it. And I've got to say, you know, for many of us, I think I'm almost ashamed to say, I think were it me, I probably would have fallen in a heap if I was really honest with you. But uh, you have done quite the opposite. You've just picked up and you've just, pivoted once again and and carried on. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a, a function of a number of factors. I think I was brought up that way very much. My father went through two wars and he seemed to come out of it a very balanced, positive individual. Um, and I think that's one of the things, as I said, you can only choose how you respond to these situations. And the first step is to realise, give it some context. Uh, okay, I, I've had a setback. But there's people in certain nations who have a setback where every day they have to walk five miles to get a bucket of fresh water for their kids. Uh, so if I was to sort of whinge about this, I, I in myself I'd feel somewhat uh, disappointed in my own perspective. Uh, so I think the first thing you have to do is achieve the context and then look towards the positive of it, that at least we live in a nation where the healthcare system is such that it can be addressed. And also that I was under a, a regime within the medical system for aviation that detected the issue and monitored it. So if I wasn't in aviation and I didn't live in Australia, the outcome would have been totally different. So that straight away there's two positives. Now, 
in terms of how I respond, I can either sort of get down in the dumps and that's not going to help the recovery from either a psychological or a physical aspect. So the best way to get over it is to get over it and um, start to start to walk the walk and talk the talk and you literally walk the walk. I'm doing between 5 and 10 kilometres a day, um, three months post-surgery. So I, as I said, I think you can only choose how you respond and that will vary from person to person. But if you start to think of the positives, and sometimes it's hard to look through the, the haze of disappointment, but it, there is always a positive. And I know it, it sounds like something people have on their coffee cups, but it is actually the truth as far as I'm concerned. And the thing, the thing that really is really interesting, Owen, of course, is this is not the first career bump for you. Of course, you were a pilot with ANSET when that went down. And in an earlier series of Plane Crazy Down Under, we've been right through this, but just for context, if you could tell us about the day that ANSET went down and how long were you out of work for? Was it less than an hour? Yeah, the morning that uh, ANSET collapsed, actually, I was crewed to do Flight 1 to Melbourne. And uh, my wife, as, as you've mentioned, is also a pilot. She dropped me at the ANSET terminal. And uh, lo and behold, the uh, automatic doors wouldn't open and the passengers were also trapped outside. And subsequently, one of the security guards came and vectored me through the uh, valet parking down to our pigeonholes in the crew room. I cleaned out my pigeonhole and then I was escorted back to the footpath. So this was all at about 4.30, quarter to five in the morning. And uh, at that point, I thought, okay, what's next? And I managed to to get into the car and then uh, drove out to Bankstown Airport and waited for, I knew a number of people there still because I, I, I've maintained my instructor rating and fronted up and had a job, I'd say, within about 40 minutes of, of walking out the door at um, Ansett. It was a job as a ground instructor, but the thing it did was it encouraged me or forced me almost to get up every morning, keep them disciplined, put a tie on, and I was also in that aviation circle. And I've always enjoyed training, so... Uh, yeah, it, it was a case of, okay, how are we going to respond? And it's one of those things that we do in the cockpit, don't we? If something goes wrong, we respond to it. We don't harp on what's occurred. We, we might look back in terms of how could we have done it better, but fundamentally we respond to what we have in front of us and we try to make the best of that. So, Owen, how would you say your pilot training, your experience as a pilot and so on, has helped you with that resilience? Because you've spoken about just then, you don't rev- you don't dwell on it, you just get on with it. Uh, would you say that your training as a pilot, both private, commercial, airline, transport pilot, ha- how has that imp- impacted on your ability to survive all these setbacks? Well, I think it's probably a smorgasbord of of everything that I've been through since I was a youngster. I grew up in a family where that was the attitude. Um, When I was in the ambulance service, it also gave me perspective on people. There's always someone worse off. And then in terms of, as you say, in your private training, your commercial training, your airline training, it is to diagnose the problem, work out a solution, execute that solution, and then review, am I going down the right path? Don't just sit and forget once you've found a solution, but review it and say, okay, this is what I've chosen to do. Is there anything further I want to modify? So you can apply those to any aspect of life or business, in my opinion, but the uh, aviation sphere is very good because it breaks it down into rather disciplined point form uh, structures that that are easy to follow. Not that I sit there analysing it that way, but I think it just wires your brain to respond to a situation rather than whinge about it. The good thing, I suppose, from uh, out of all of this is that the airline for which you work, they've been they seem to me to have been supportive of you. So they've given you other roles that you can engage in and use that experience in other ways for the time being, pending uh, you know a result on your medical down the track. Absolutely. No, the, the company's been fantastic. And it, once again, looking at the positive side of it, I, in a ground role that I haven't held before, I'm gaining better insights into the industry and the airline and how things operate. So it's a learning experience for me. And I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that the uh, International Pilots Association, uh, which is effectively the union, have also been very good. They've made regular phone calls just to check on welfare. So 
I, I'd say it's the aviation community. The, the company has been very good, but I think there's something about aviation, and I hope we don't lose that because it has disappeared in other fields, that there is a sense of a community and a, a sense of bond that we share. And we also put ourselves in the position and go, gee, I wonder if that happened to me, how I'd feel about mm. it. The number of guys that have called me regularly since the, the diagnosis, I've just been overwhelmed. And once again, that's another reason to be positive. There's a lot of people out there who actually care. That's excellent to hear. And I think another another positive um, outcome that we could have from this, and because there's always a lot of negativity around this particular subject, is the subject of pilot medicals. I mean, they are important. And I know a lot of us get very frustrated with the regulator, but we shouldn't fear our dummy. It's a message that I know you've you've said to me privately offline, but it just resonates with me. We, we shouldn't fear it. It's for the best. Absolutely. Uh, it was the fact that I had regular medicals that they could plot a trend and that they could diagnose the issue and address it. And it might all be well of your license is on the line and that is never a good feeling. It, it probably results in a few blood pressure points every time you do a, a pilot's medical. But um, fundamentally, your health comes first. And if you don't have that, then you're not going to be useful to anyone, be it an airline or be it your family. So, yes, there is a definite fear in some quarters of probably being um, candid with your dami, but I, I couldn't speak highly enough of it. The whole process has been supportive from my dami. Um, yeah, the whole process and outcome for me thus far has been a very positive experience. Uh, I, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, uh, but if you do have to deal with it, once again, we live in a great country where the, the support is there. And we don't really want to go into the nuts and bolts of exactly what the medical issue is, but what is the process to come back now? Not only dealing with your dami, but obviously there's oversight from the regulator. Have they played much of a role in this? Uh, well, at the moment, it's a six-month minimum post-operative before they'll even review the case because I think they just want to see stability in your condition for at least six months after the operation. And... The dami runs with it fundamentally, and I gather that the regulator, if they want to put more um, constraints or, or tests or hoops for me to jump through at that stage, they'll advise the dami and then I'll have to comply. The dami is effectively the intermediary who draws together all the, the specialists, et cetera, and provides that information. I don't know in detail what will happen in six months because one of the things that one of the um, surgeons actually said to me was so they, they were amazed that you have to wait six months because they're in their opinion I'm better stronger and better equipped than I, I was before and I said no they want to wait six months and he said well don't make any decisions or consider anything for six months just focus on your recovery and he said when the six months comes up deal with it then and that made a lot of sense to me so that's why I've been doing endless slaps of bowel it's kind of like an emergency checklist in and of itself, isn't it? Well, this has happened, so this is the procedure we do for now. It's just uh, instead of, you know, being a, a five- or ten-minute process in the cockpit, it's just a little bit more elongated. Yeah, and, and as you say, uh, you respond in an orderly manner. Uh, it, 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 it aids, for personally, it aids in terms of mentally processing it as well. You have an objective where you want to get to. Where am I now? How do I, I get between those two points? And you just keep moving forward. And early in any recovery, that there's days where you plateau or you go backwards, but you just keep persevering. And uh, if you keep your eye on the prize at the end of it, so be it. Whatever motivates you. It's it's like one of your more recent books, "Do It Like a Pilot," uh, as the joke goes. And it's not really a joke, but it's keep flying the aircraft all the way through the crash until it stops. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. It, and it's funny that I wrote that book in COVID, um, thinking about all the pilots that were out of work, but we had a skill set that was applicable to personal and, and, and business sense, uh, the process of decision making, the process of pausing or sitting on your hands, all of those things that are, are imparted upon trainee pilots are actually skill sets that are transferable. And I wrote that book uh, during COVID 
and now I probably should go back and read it because it's pretty relevant to me now. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It, it, the education we receive as, as air crew, I think there's a lot of transferable skills if you just think how to apply them. It's where I believe that sport is a fantastic um, medium too. I'm very – it's life's lessons without getting hurt. You know, sometimes you're the, the best team but you'll lose. Sometimes you'll win luckily and other times you just have to ground out a real ugly win. Mm. Uh, and and that's life. And I've ha- taken so many things away from sport. The, even when I was – Kirill and I went down to um, the coast for – Oh, gee, just about two or three days because I hadn't been out of the house for since I'd come out of hospital. And I, I was doing my walk, but there were hills at this place and where I've been walking is relatively flat. And there was a hill and I was like, oh, gee, because I was only a couple of weeks out of hospital. But it was my sporting brain that kicked in and went, okay, you're just going to have to push through this. Uh, there is an objective there. It's not out of reach. Just keep going. So I think... A combination of self-discipline and having played a lot of sport was definitely a, a help as well. And my hat's off to you for that uh, amount of walking you're doing. I'm, I'm doing the uh, Soldier on March on Challenge. Yeah. Last year I did fractionally more than the Kokoda length. This year I signed myself up for Kokoda and back. Yeah, I tell him he's dreaming. Uh, <laughs> I might get one and a half if I'm lucky, but uh, – yeah, I'm raising money for Soldier On. I'm oh, doing it in memory of my father who passed last year and uh, the ADF people I work with at the moment and for my niece who's now with the Navy. Cool. Yeah, no, it's it's. I, I'm pretty sure it's a habit I've got into and I will maintain now. I was always pretty fit and that was probably one of the frustrations is that you walk down the street and you see all these people who are unfit and then I got hit with it. But on the other side of the coin, and this is where I talk about having a positive response, is the fact that I was fit, my recovery has been better. Yeah. Um, it, it, I saw people in hospital who weren't fit and their road was going to be a lot tougher than mine. Um, so uh, even the physio had come around and see me in hospital and sort of go, can you do this, can you do that? Yeah, you're fine. And then they'd go in the next room and they'd be in there for half an hour just trying to get them to get up out of the chair without using their arms. <laughs> that thing's only just been sewn back together. So you have to, everything you do, you have to do without using your arms, which means my, my buttocks are sublime, but my um, upper body is atrophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, I've, I've, I'm doing a lot of hand weights as well to, to build back up across here. But, yeah, it was a real interesting experience. And, and that's what I mean. Um, okay, ants are collapsed, but... God, my life has been interesting. If if Ants had hadn't collapsed, I would have been 7-3 training captain, 7-6 training captain. But sitting in Centrelink being told I was highly skilled and totally useless um, got me into writing. Yeah, got me, got me into writing. And you think about what I've done by virtue of the writing, the flight review. So I've flown around 100 different types of aeroplanes. Airbus flew me to Toulouse and Spain to cover their military and civil operate. Like, my life has been so interesting. Okay, it, it set back the seniority probably 10 or 15 years. But beyond that, it it was a win. It was a win. And and you've got to fly around Australia and all that kind of stuff, raise money for the yeah. flying doctors. Yeah. All sorts of things, which I probably wouldn't have done. I probably would have just been your seniority ladder climber and not looked sideways. So sometimes adversity can force you to look, widen your vision, and um, that is, has definitely helped me. Oh, and there's so many great key messages in there, and I, I think we can all really take something away from that and, and just be positive. And as you say, just concentrate on the things you can control and don't, maybe don't sweat the, sweat the other stuff, isn't it? That's really the key message. Ab- absolutely. Consider what you can control and action that the best you can and be aware that there might be a day or two where – you, you get frustrated, but that's part of life as well. The fact is we're in a great country 
And if you're going to make forward progress in anything, we're, we're in the place. We're, we've got the medical support systems, we've got friends, we've got family, we've got everything we need to move forward. The only thing potentially that'll hold us back is our own attitude. 100%, mate. Just a beautiful messaging. We're going to leave this very serious subject behind and talk 747s after the break. Stick with us, folks. We'll be right back after this short break with our very special guest, Owen's Up. <laughs> If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're in the aviation industry. You could also be spending bucket loads of cash on advertising your business. Well, this won't cost you bucket loads. Advertise here on Plane Crazy Down Under, listened to by hundreds of aviation enthusiasts and professionals who might really like to hear about how your business could help theirs. We'll even throw in some advertising on our website as part of the deal. See our affordable rates at www.planecrazydownunder.com. Just click on the advertising with PCDU link. So the new GE Aviation GE9X engines they're building for the new 777X have a 10%... Carl, Carl, what on earth are you on about? It's like a different language. Here at the Plane Talking UK studios, we like to do things a little differently. If you've got a keen interest in aviation, join us each week where we'll give you an in-depth rundown of all the weekly news from around the world with a focus on what matters to us here in the UK. With regular interviews from people living and working in the industry, we'll take you behind the scenes of some of the biggest air shows, airports and airlines from across the globe. To find our podcast, take yourself to www.plaintalkinguk.com. Look for us on iTunes, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. The Plain Talking UK podcast, the show where we talk plain English made by a passenger for anyone. Hi, it's Rob Mark from JetWine.com and the Airplane Geeks. And whenever I'm in Australia, I listen to those two crazies, Steve and Grant, at the Plain Crazy Down Under podcast. Of course, I'm not really in Australia that often, but if I were in Australia often, I would... I'd have no hesitation at all recommending Stephen Grant's show to anyone who had very little to do with their time. Of course, actually, I've never even been to Australia. Playing crazy down under. Don't leave home without them. You're listening to Playing Crazy Down Under. Thanks very much for joining us. Our very special guest is journalist, author, and airline captain, Owen Zup. Owen, let's put all that serious stuff aside now and let's talk about some fun stuff. The final flight of the 747 for Qantas now. Okay, we talk about things we can't control, and there's a lot of people in the aviation community who, you know, are pretty sad to see the 747 go. Perhaps none of us wanted to see it happen, but it it was time. It, it had had its time, and, of course, I guess that was hastened by COVID. But um, a lot of our listeners might be interested to know that you were actually on the flight crew of that last flight. Yes, once again, um, I was very fortunate to be on that flight. And it, uh, in a long career, it'd have to rank in probably the top 10 experiences. And in the context of I didn't fly again then for more than two years because of the COVID downturn, it was even more remarkable when you reflect back upon it. That we and the fact that we were able to execute it with all that was going on in the world at that time. I'm curious about the flight planning for that. Everybody knows that, of course, you went up into the sky off the east coast of Australia and drew a great big flying kangaroo in the sky. Um, much to everybody's surprise, who was one of the millions who were tracking that flight on Flight Radar 24 and similar sites. Can you tell us a bit about the, the thought process that went into that and the, the planning for it? And especially the bit about flying over Haas at Wollongong where the uh, oh, yes. 747-400 is parked. Yeah, the, there were a number of components to it. There was the, the harbour fly past, then the salute to OJA at Albion Park, and then the kangaroo off the coast that was uh, the sky art. I'll put my hand up and say I was a part of the crew, but the, the genius behind that was was other members of the crew who'd come up with the idea. Uh, in terms of planning it, it was, uh, from what he told me, it was a very interesting exercise because when they first pulled it up on Google Earth, they had to look at it, then they had to convert to lat longs, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had to consider how tightly an aircraft could turn around the tip of a tail um, and what speed you could do that at. Oh, gee, well, if we were doing that, we'd prefer to have the flaps out. Well, then we can't be above flight level 200. Oh, but if we're sliding down the back of the creature, well, we don't want to waste time. We can climb up and go far. There was a million variables. Um, and I came in at 
probably the the eleventh hour after all the hard work had been done. Um, so I was very fortunate. I take my hat off totally to to the chaps that came up with it, and it wasn't just the the tech crew who did it. It was all the support from the the teams in airspace management. It was defence because the airspace at Williamtown. Uh, there were just so many stakeholders that made that happen. And whilst it seemed to have a degree of secrecy about it, um, we weren't to tell anyone it was happening, it wasn't for media purposes. It was because there were certain environmental conditions we had to meet to be able to do it. Uh, If the wind was above a certain speed or the turbulence level, well, it probably wasn't going to be ideal to, to draw the kangaroo. So it wasn't until we got up there and saw what the wind was and the conditions that we sent uh, a message back to our flight dispatch basically saying it's a go and that's when it was media released. So it wasn't for uh, drum roll, ladies and gentlemen. It was just to see that it was meeting the parameters that it could be executed. Um, but, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. As I said, definitely within the top ten of my career in terms of... Uh, the harbour and the salute to AJA and the kangaroo, uh, those were all pre-flown in the um, simulator to trial out what had been worked out in theory and uh, all all of those to try and highlight what the problems were or potential problems were, I should say. And there were so many little things that came up, even to the degree that they tried to uh, do the automatic uplink of the flight plan into the flight management computer, but it was just too many waypoints. So they had to be all manually um, loaded in. So with all the the festivities that were happening, uh, two of the crew members had actually sat up there longhand, entered all the waypoints in. Uh, There were about 75 just for the kangaroo. Um, So they'd put those in. So while everyone was standing on the stairs sort of doing the waving shot, uh, there was a big yellow note, don't touch anything, basically, because um, it had all been put in longhand. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 but it was a, like I said, I've been very fortunate in my career to be part of amazing flights and experiences from that solo flight around Australia in a Jabiru to, to flying over the Antarctica, all sorts of things. And to be privy to, to watch this take place, like I said, I just can't count myself lucky enough. It's It's been amazing. Well, we've been really fortunate to have been able to, to, to share a lot of those journeys with you, which has been the great thing about modern media and social media, I guess. I wonder about the mood um, on departure, first off, and then getting into Los Angeles and then eventually getting across to the Boneyard. If we deal with Sydney first, was it a – I know it was COVID time, so perhaps it was a bit restricted even, but was it melancholy? Was it – you know, was it a celebratory? What what was the feel? Well, I, th- I think um, that was possibly one of the most commonly asked questions that was posed to me was, gee, are you, you're sad that this is happening, et cetera, very emotive type questions. And me personally, and I, I won't speak on behalf of the crew, but just watching how everyone um, operated, we were so focused on the task and aware of what we had to do, that I don't think emotion came into it at all, really. We were aware it was something very, very special, but we also realised we're we're flying down Sydney Harbour at a relatively low altitude in a 747. We're then going OCTA, outside controlled airspace, to overfly Albion Park, and then we're popping up to draw a kangaroo off the coast, and then over to um, Los Angeles and then we're going to do this final flight to Mojave and there was even on that short hop there was a 172 trying to get a a good look. Um, So I think all of the crew, there was a really high degree of professionalism and I always quote that it wasn't until we'd sort of parked the brakes that last time and and Robert Penfold, the journalist, was there in in America and, and different people that you sort of saw us relax somewhat and be able to, and it wasn't that it was tense, it wasn't tense at all, but we were just aware that so many people were watching and we were aware that this had to be done just right and we had parameters, environmental, et cetera, 
And it wasn't until the job was done that I think we allowed ourselves to relax. And I, the thing I vividly remember is after we left Mojave in a minibus heading back to Manhattan Beach, I was sitting up the back. There was no chatter. People were just either looking out the window or, or dozing off. And it, I think that was the first time that we probably, any of us, were a bit reflective or emotive. I think up until that point, we were very task focused and um, just trying to execute as professionally as we could. And I know that sounds like a company line, but it, it really was how it was operated. And there was certainly a lot of, as you said, a lot of people following it. Uh, you had some fun getting to Mojave, like you said, the Cessna. Uh, but then it wasn't like this was during the height of COVID. So you'd park the aircraft, but now you had to get back because. To be honest, when I heard that this was happening, I totally would have paid good money to be on that flight as uh, like doing journalist media kind of stuff. But that wasn't happening. It was just yourselves. And then you had to get back. How was it coming back to reality, so to speak? Yeah, it, just one point on the departure when you said a lot of people watching us. Uh, when we first departed and then we started to turn back to go up the, was it up the back of the leg? I forget which part. But we turned back towards the Australian coastline and there were people in the Los Angeles office who thought, oh, they've got a technical issue, they're turning around, and went to, they went to bed because uh, <laughs> it had been kept that under wraps that no one knew what we were doing and they thought, oh, they're turning back and they closed the door and went to bed. Um, but uh, not everyone, obviously, but there were a few. Uh, yeah, it was in the height, well, not the height of COVID. It was still somewhat alien to us. I think it first hit home when we uh, arrived in Los Angeles. Firstly, the terminal was basically empty. Uh, one other flight had come in, I think, and I saw people in, in full-body paper suits with clear Perspex visors and... Uh, it brought some memories back for me because I, I was an ambulance officer when the AIDS um, uh, epidemic first raised its head and we were gowning up like that because uh, we didn't know what was involved. And it, it sort of brought that back to me, but there were people there waiting to go through customs totally gowned up. We were obviously masks and, and we had to isolate and we were allowed to go out to get food and go straight back to the... Um, accommodation but it was it was very stringent and to walk around los angeles admittedly at manhattan beach to go and get food and come back and not see another human being uh it was like some hollywood western you were half expecting spin effects to be tumbleweed down the road um <laughs> but it, it was yeah. definitely an eerie feeling to see that in in, in the united states yeah. but this was very early in the pandemic very early. Somewhat post-apocalyptic, to say the least. It, it was. It had that feel to a degree. And um, I, I didn't know what to expect when we got there. It wasn't the, the, in the forefront of my mind. But when we got there and with the restrictions and that, it really did hit home. Well, Owen, we've followed so many of your books, adventures. We've been there to catch up with you when you came through Melbourne and Point Cook on your Around Australia. And... I remember reading about your adventures bringing back a 737 for Qantas on its inaugural flight from uh, Boeing down to Australia. And now you're a Qantas captain once you get to go back to fly. How do you feel about like you've, you've had so many different platforms, so many different experiences to be back as a captain on the 737? Does it feel like a homecoming? <laughs> it, it feels like a homecoming. It didn't make the sim training in that any easier. <laughs> 11,000 hours on the aeroplane and I was still studying like a drover's dog. But, um, yeah, it, if my career was to um, wind up for conditions beyond my control, I can't think of a more rounded finish to it than the left seat of 737, which was my first airliner. So there's some sort of cosmic synergy or there at work. But, uh, yeah, it, it was like a homecoming. And it's amazing how you do remember things. The chap in the other seat had quizzed me on a question and I gave him the answer and I can guarantee it wasn't because I read it within the preceding six months. It's because I read it in about 1993. 
Um, <laughs> it was uh, edited in. It, the first takeoff I did do in the simulator, though, I remember, um, having spent so long in the right-hand seat, uh, I went to trim the aircraft and I pushed the microphone button because <laughs> the switch was the other way around. So, um, yeah, it was a homecoming but was also a bit of a wake-up call. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a very special aeroplane to me, my first and and quite possibly it'll be my last. Um, so it's nicely bookended. But in between those bookends there's been a hell of a lot of different novels. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you're going to be able to write, a, able to write another novel after uh, you come out, come out the other side of this, mate. But I have every confidence, and and all our listeners as well too, after listening to this interview, that uh, if anyone's going to get through this this current piece of of uh, personal adversity, it'll be you, my friend, and uh, we'll see you back in the left seat of that seven three seven. And let's hope, Grant. Uh, I reckon uh, when he does that, we should be on that flight ourselves to celebrate. Oh, it sounds like a great idea. That'll be good, fellas. It's good to have you guys around as well. Uh, making a comeback, so uh, the old fellas are all coming back around. It seems. Yeah, we're all we're all doing it. We're all doing it. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's been it's been great, fellas. The website is owensup dot com, folks. If you haven't checked that out recently, make sure you head over there and check out Owen's writing. Buy one of his books and uh, support someone who's a, a really really important aviator and someone who's uh, really very much into supporting all of us here in the aviation community. Owen, thanks very much for joining us. Anytime. I love chatting with you, fellas. Thanks very much, mate, and we'll uh, talk to you again at some stage in the future. You know, Grant, we've got so many other really cool things we could talk to Owen about, and I'm I'm looking forward to having him on a bit more regularly. But uh, I think an important message there too to get across is that uh, while Owen has some, some really great messaging there that we can all learn from, not all of us are perhaps wired the same way, and mental health is a very, very big issue these days, a very big issue in the community. And for those of you who might be doing it a bit tough, just reach out and talk to someone. There are plenty of organisations around here in Australia. Of course, we have Beyond Blue, the Black Dog Institute and places like that. Find a friend. Find someone that you can talk to and just get it off your chest and, and talk through issues. Yep, and you've got Men's Shed as well, I believe, does pretty good work in that area. And, um, yeah, a lot of groups, uh, particularly for guys, it seems a lot of guys don't really do the uh, bearing their soul and unloading type of thing that uh, it's... It does actually help. And of course, if your company offers access to counselling and if you've got a few things that are causing hassles in your life, by all means, take them up on it. It's highly recommended. Absolutely. And if things are really dire, just remember there's always Lifeline here in Australia, 13 11 14. Make sure you give them a ring. Well, you know what? Drop us a line here and I'll have a chat to you anytime. Mental health is something I'm really passionate about. And uh, I tell you, I've reached out to a lot of friends over the time, including my good friend on the other side of this studio. So um, there's some really important messaging there. But let's hope that we can all learn something from uh, what we've uh, talked to Owen about and even messaging similarly from Matt Hall in our previous episode. Try not to be overwhelmed by the things that you can't control and just concentrate on those things you can. And I think that's really the uh, the key message in this one. And uh, I think that's a really positive way to uh, cap off this episode. I agree, mate. And, uh, yeah, if you're feeling a bit down, reach out and chat. As Steve said, we're out here and, uh, you know, we're crazy, so we're willing to have a chat. Absolutely. Contact at Playing Crazy Down Under, folks. That's where you can uh, drop us a line about anything you like. Uh, We'd certainly love to hear from you, certainly about story ideas and really anything else you'd like to chat to us about. But until next time, Steve Fisher and Grant McHeron wishing you safe flying and we'll talk to you again soon. Find show notes for this episode along with our contact details and a full back catalogue of shows at playingcrazydownunder.com. Drop us a line anytime with feedback, story suggestions or advertising inquiries. We'd love to hear from you. Title music is You Name It by Brian Simpson. Playing Crazy Down Under is a Southern Skies media production. Southern Skies Media.